everybody. So we are talking about motivation today. And motivation is a very, it's probably the least understood concept, but it's definitely the most talked about. And I know in each of our lives, we probably talked about our own motivations and how that shows up in certain parts of our lives, right? Whether we're a student or an athlete um, or an exerciser or just in our personal lives, what is it? Why are we motivated to do certain things? What is it about certain situations that I'm in that make me motivated or unmotivated to perform, to do those things? So we're definitely going to dive into it. We are going to talk about, first of all, what motivation is, what it looks like for certain people in certain situations. And then we're going to dive into a few theories that will explain, hopefully help us to explain what influences motivation in people's lives. Okay, so first we obviously want to define what motivation is. And there's two parts that you need to know, and that is the motivation is the direction and the intensity of effort, okay? And so what, what do we mean by direction? By direction of effort, we're referring to whether an individual seeks out approaches or is attracted to situations, right? So if I am a runner and I am doing my first marathon, I have never done it before. And so I need to improve my endurance when it comes to running, right? Not necessarily speed. I want to be able to make sure that I am able to complete 26.2 miles, which I've never done before. And so the direction of my effort will work towards everything that I need to do in order to improve my endurance as opposed to someone who might be working on their speed, say they're a track runner, then the direction of effort will go into that, right? And the process for that will probably look a lot different. And so again, it's those things that I need to do in order to focus and achieve that particular goal, that direction that I'm going in. And then the second part is this intensity of effort, which refers to how much effort um, an individual puts forth into a situation. So how much effort am I putting into my speed, into those tasks that I need to do in order to improve my speed? How much? So this, this lies on a continuum, right? It's obviously high or low, and that depends on the situation that you're in. That'll change um, constantly depending on what situation you're in. And so here are a couple of questions that, again, guide those two parts of this definition, right? Where is our energy being directed? What tasks engage us, right? So um, let's say you're a student who is really motivated to do well in this class, right? This sports psychology class. And that could be because sports psychology is more interesting to you. Um, it's part of your major. And so it engages you more. And so when you're in these type of classes where, where you're engaged, your motivation is likely to be higher as opposed to maybe a chemistry class or a math class that you don't enjoy and that you're not engaged in, right? So that, um, depending on the task and again, the situation that you're in, your motivation can differ. And again, what drives us to get what we want, reach our goals. So how much effort are you, how intense, how much effort are you putting into reaching these goals? So there are a couple of ways that people view motivation and, and what makes someone more or less motivated to do things. It's really this debate of trait versus state. When we're talking about trait, we're talking about the person as an individual, right? Um, what their personality is like, sort of their upbringing, what's made them become who they are. That is trait. And the state part of it is more about the situation that this person is in. What is the environment like? Is that affecting this person and their motivation? So when we're looking at motivation in this trait-centered view, we're saying that their behavior is primarily a function of individual characteristics, which is what I just said, right? It's that person's personality. Maybe they're a Kobe Bryant and they have this mama mentality that really is innate. It's who they are. It's how they function. It's how they function through everything in their life. And so that can, that can be considered a trait centered view. Then we have this situation centered view in which motivation level is determined primarily by a situation. Okay. And again, this 
can go back to you sitting in a, this sports psych class versus a math class. And maybe it's just because you are in a sports psych class, which you're really interested in, that's your situation, you're more motivated versus a math class where you don't like it very much and you don't think you're good at it. So in the math class, your motivation is extremely low. And then this third view is sort of a combination of those two, right? Your behavior results from an interaction of both participant factors and situational factors. And really this view is the more popular one. It's the one most sports psychologists use um, when considering and studying motivation. It's, it's that, it's, it's both, right? It's the individual and the situation they're in, those interact to create this motivating behavior. So here's a really great model to sort of illustrate what I just explained, right? The outcome here is the participant's motivation, which is down at the bottom. And you have personal or trait-centered factors and situational factors that work together to create that motivation, okay? And so you think about the context that this athlete is in, right? You have the coaching situation, maybe a the particular team that they're on, what their relationship is like with their teammates. So if all that is good and great, right? And you have the personal factors where your athlete might need support from their coach, but also need support from their athletes. Um, they're really confident and all of those things are working well. Then they interact and that is likely to lead to really high positive motivation as opposed to maybe maybe the situational factors aren't great, right? And the person needs these specific things, but they're not getting it. And so if they're not getting it, those things combine, it's likely that that person doesn't wanna be, doesn't wanna be there, right? Doesn't wanna be on that team anymore. And so their motivation is, is pretty low. And so let's get into some examples of what personal factors can look like. These person-centered sources of motivation. Again, there's those traits, those personality traits. These are usually stable, so they don't change. It's usually just who you are as a person. That can be your achievement, your level of achievement, right? How ambitious you are, that, that usually doesn't change no matter what situation you're in. Um, your self-esteem, your self-confidence, that pain threshold that athletes have. And then you have your personal style, right? These are usually learned. They're influenced by your own experience. So how competitive you are, how aggressive you can be, your, your ability to cope in certain situations, things like that. Then you have needs, which is shared by most people. Usually people want, people, people want these things when they do stuff, right? They want recognition, approval, self-control. They want to feel good about themselves. These are three personal factors where motivation can come from. And then we have situational factors. And so this shows a good example of some situational factors that can affect someone's motivation, right? And so we have three examples here of motivation sources um, in terms of exercise. So if we look at the environment, so the environment is a situational factor, right? So what environment works best for you. If we look at the example here, is, is it an exercise facility that's near your home or work where it's easy to get to? Is it at home where you have more privacy? Those environments, those changing environments are all situational factors. And then here in the middle, we have sources of social support. So these also can be changed, right? So what gives you the most motivation to work? Is it being in a group or exercise class, right? Is it maybe having just one partner? What, what sort of setting do you need in order to have the most motivation? And so incentives are also sources of motivation, right? And we'll get into extrinsic motivation in just a little bit, but what do you get out of exercising? Is it this physical appearance, this improved physical ap appearance? Maybe you're making a lot of friends in, at the gym. Those are all factors in the, in the exercise setting that can influence your motivation. Okay, so let's get into this interactional view a little bit more. So here we have a swimmer who is on two different swim events. They do an individual swim 
competition and then a relay on a team, right? So they have two different competitive situations here. It's important to realize that an athlete's personality type can really influence the way they swim in certain situations, okay? So here we have two different competitive situations and then two different personality characteristics, right? We have approval oriented, which means they're motivated by the fact that they want people, they want to be approved by those around them, right? They want to um, make their teammates happy. They want to make the coach happy. And so that's what drives their motivation. And then this other person is rejection threatened. So they are afraid to disappoint people. They don't want to do that. Um, and so that affects how well they do in certain competitive situations, right? If they are approval oriented and they are swimming alone, there's not really much motivation to do well, right? Because they're not getting that approval from a teammate as opposed to if they are approval oriented and they swim with a team, they're motivated to do well because if they do, then they are getting that approval from their teammates. And so here we have rejection threatened. And so again, if they don't want to disappoint their teammates and if losing and disappointing them is sort of the worst thing that can happen, then their motivation to swim on a team is not gonna be very high, right? They, they don't wanna do it because they, they're afraid of what's gonna happen. And so they're likely to perform lower or not even perform at all on a team. As opposed to them swimming alone, all that wouldn't matter, right? Because they're swimming alone and, they, and their performance is solely dependent on them, right? They're not gonna disappoint anybody. Their performance is strictly on them alone. And so they would work best in that type of situation. And so again, this is just an example of that interactional approach to motivation, right? There are individual characteristics and also situational, or in this case, the, the competitive situation, right? The type of competition that they're in um, that can affect someone's motivation. So typically as a sport psychology consultant, one of the first questions that I tend to ask my athletes is, why do you play? Why do you play your sport? What is it that keeps you going? And what's really surprising is that a lot of athletes, it takes them a while to really come up with the reasons as to why they continue to keep playing their sport, right? They have been playing for so long that they haven't really thought about it anymore. It's just kind of part of their life. And so it's important to realize that there's, there's probably a variety of reasons as to why they do it. And that's what we're learning about here is that there's not just one reason. There's not just one source of motivation that keeps them going. There's multiple things that go into it. If we look into the major motives for why people participate in sport. And so if we look at the major motives for why people participate in sport, we see that it's mainly these six things, right? Especially as children, I feel like a lot of this definitely applies um, when we start playing sports as, as young kids. Um, and that includes improving skills, right? Learning and improving skills. Having fun is huge. Again, when it comes to youth sport, that's the number one things boys and girls report to be their number one reason. Being with friends, so people tend to play sports for years and years at a time and spend a lot of time with each other. And so our teammates quickly become our very good friends. There's experiences of thrills and excitements, especially when it comes to competition, that feeling of achieving success and then developing fitness, right? Maintaining this healthy lifestyle. And so here I'm gonna show you a quick video of Dr. Ken Hodges, who is going to explain his view at who, who really has the power and the influence of building motivation in athletes. I think the most important about motivation is there's only one person on the planet can motivate someone and that's that person themselves. It's not to say that other people can't have a role, but the analogy I use is um, coaches and parents and involved adults and, and role models are often 
perceived, particularly by the media and by other people, as being motivators. That coach is a great motivator. Well, I, 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 the analogy I would use, well, they can't give their athlete motivation. In fact, the person has to have that motivational fuel, if you like. But the coach can be a spark plug or a match. They can help light that fire. On the other hand, they also put that fire out by some coaching behaviors. So the first thing I think to realize is you can't give somebody motivation. It's not a gift. You can help them develop it, help them nurture it. And uh, some of the research, I'm sure some of the other people are talking about with intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. For intrinsic motivation is the absolute gold, if you like, not just for the character stuff we were talking about before, but also for performance. Quite a bit of research now showing that very elite athletes that get to the top and stay at the top consistently are they're, they're usually professional, they're making money, but they're motivated by intrinsic goals. And if the coach appreciates that and monitors what they're doing that might be helping or supporting the athlete achieve his goals, but also monitoring some of the things that may inadvertently be squashing those goals or getting in the way or interfering. So it's, for me, the key is realizing I'm not a motivator, I'm a coach. I can help with motivation, but I'm not a motivator. So, uh, so the key things to facilitate motivation is number one, realize that the, the athlete's the only person that can motivate her or himself. You as a coach can certainly have a huge role and contribute to it, but the athlete's got to have the motivation and fuel in the first place. So then your mindset needs to be, well, if the athlete's got the fuel, have they got enough fuel? How do I get them to fill that fuel tank up further? If it is full, how do I make sure they can use it to its max? How can they empty that tank and then fill it up again? So some of the bullet points could be like, first for ask athletes, well, why do you play this sport? And really politely push them beyond just, oh, it's fun or I enjoy it or it's, uh, or because I'm good at it, which is a classic. Well, what, but why does that matter? What is it about good that makes you, and usually people say, oh, it makes me feel good. So get them to really drill down and dig around and well, why do I play this sport? And for some people, in my experience, a lot of athletes have seldom been asked that in a meaningful way and actually pushed to be self-reflective about it. So you help the athlete appreciate why they played. And often for a senior athlete, it's good to think back to why did they start the sport all those years ago? And they may have drifted away from that. So that's one key. The other key would be what can I do as the coach to enhance that motivation and also monitor the things, the motivational climate, if you like, that I'm responsible for helping create within the team or the squad and what can I do to support those people and their goals. It's, well, another way to think about it is intrinsic motivation is more about love of the game and, and love of the activity, whereas the coach can be involved, particularly if they've got a, in, in a reasonably serious sport situation, they want to win. So the love focus isn't just about it's all laugh and giggles and we're here to enjoy ourselves, it's that, but we also want to win. So they can create a climate that's strong on tough love. You know, we've got standards. We've got a high expectation of excellence, but we're not here to bully you or push you around. We want to empower you to be able to achieve your goals. Okay, so he touches on a couple good things in this video, right? The main thing is that athletes are in charge of their own motivation, right? You can't give someone more motivation. So coaches definitely play a role, right? They can contribute to motivation simply by changing the environment to enhance motivation. So for athletes, maybe if they're showing up every day to practice at these long trainings, long practices, um, and then one day you switch it up, you switch it up a little bit to make things more fun. Maybe you do a fun scrimmage or what have you. Now, instead of this mundane, doing the same thing over and over again and having to give 100%. Now they can give 100% at something more fun, more engaging, and thus switching up the motivational climate. Now they're more engaged. And, and as we know, getting excited about something definitely changes that and makes someone motivated. And so again, all leaders in, in these situations have a really great impact, right? We're talking about coaches. We're talking about athletic trainers physical therapists, sports psychologists, they're all influential and can create these environments that build motivation in athletes. And that starts just by understanding who the athlete is, understanding who they are, and understanding in what situation does that motivation really build. 
And so here I quickly just want to share something that something that we try to do, especially in our first few sessions with our athletes um, in sports psychology, where we try to get sort of the root of their motivation, right? And Ken Hodge was talking about this, where you're really digging deeper into the why, right? We're not talking about those surface level, um, the six top reasons of why people participate in sport, right? Not those basic six, but really digging deeper and, and finding out their, their real why, their real motivation for doing something. And so here are a couple questions that really help you get into, into that deeper level of thinking, right? So what aspect of your day sport gives you energy? This is a really important thing that can be really useful for coaches to know, right? So what part of practice makes them excited? Um, what can we replicate to, to continue to build that energy? And this again, what are three or four times that you felt most alive? So again, not necessarily in your day to day, but three or four times in your life where you felt alive, right? What, what gives them that excitement that maybe we can incorporate into our practices or competitions? How do you define personal success? So understanding an athlete's end goal and what counts as achievement for them is very important. What do you want your legacy to be, right? So when you walk away from your sport, what do you want to leave behind? Is this something that you work towards every day? Is this something that you show every day? And then lastly, my why statement, right? So, so why do you do this? So continue asking why, why, why until you get to, to the deep rooted stuff that will really make a difference in a person's motivation. Okay, so a couple more things before we get into theories. Um, we wanna talk a little bit about achievement motivation and competitiveness. So these are two motives that really influence why people participate in sport. And that is someone's level of achievement motivation and someone's level of competitiveness. These obviously differ from person to person. And so when we look at the levels of these two motives in individuals, we can have a better sense of how motivated they are. Okay, so first we have achievement motivation, which is a person's orientation to strive for task success, persist in the face of failure and experience pride in accomplishments. So how bad does someone want to succeed? That is essentially what achievement motivation is. And competitiveness is, is a term we've all used before, but essentially that strive to be the best when compared with others or compared to a standard. And so there are two distinct differences between these two, right? Achievement motivation is self-comparison of achievement. So really you are your own worst critic. You are achieving a goal that you have set for yourself and how bad do you want that goal, right? As opposed to competitiveness, this is more of a social comparison. So you don't have control over the other person, but, but the key here is that you are just comparing yourself to another individual. And so what exactly influences achievement motivation? Choosing the right activity can influence if you succeed or not. You can seek out competition who may not be as good as you are or have the best record as you, but would that really be fulfilling for you, right? Is your goal to win or is your goal to get better? Your effort to pursue goals, so how often you practice and train. Your intensity of effort, so how hard you try in practice, how hard you try in competition will determine if you achieve or not and persistence in the face of failure and adversity. So again, when you're facing obstacles, do you work harder or do you give up? Do you take a break? What do you do? So depending on what persistence looks like for you, that influences your level of achievement motivation. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the four theories of achievement motivation. So here they are listed right here. We're gonna go through each one. And so this is need achievement theory. This theory can be really helpful because it helps us really understand patterns that athletes tend to fall into, right? And so we have these two, we have these two different personality factors that we wanna first distinguish. 
The first is this motive to achieve success. And so the capacity to experience pride in accomplishments. So this type of athlete wants to win because they feel accomplished. And then the second type of athlete has this motive to avoid failure. So their personality is that they're just trying to avoid shame and failure, right? They don't, they don't find achieving success to be accomplished. They just find shame in failure, right? So they're just trying to avoid that completely. And so those types of athletes are like the ones that I mentioned previously, right? If they're trying to avoid failure, then they are likely to choose competition, an opponent who is less ranked than them or who they are expected to for sure beat. As opposed to this athlete number one here at the top, they are likely to choose an opponent who challenges them or is up to par with them. That way when they win, they have this feeling of accomplishment in them, right? And that makes them feel good. And so we have those two types of athletes. We also have these situational factors that we're in. There may be a high or low probability of success, and there may be a high or low incentive value for success. So those two things can happen for either of those two athletes. And so depending on those two types of athletes and those situational factors that they're in, you get this resultant tendency. You're either approaching success, and so they're feeling that, that mo moment of pride, and so the behavior that comes out of that is exactly like I said, right? You tend to seek out those achievement situations, you're looking for challenges, and you, you tend to perform better if you are motivated to achieve. If you are motivated to avoid failure, then here down below, you see that you're focusing on shame of failure. And so you tend to avoid risks and challenges, you avoid achievement situations, and you perform poorly, right? So this pattern can really become very dysfunctional over time. If you're motivated to achieve failure, then you're constantly putting yourself in situations where you don't really have to be evaluated properly, right? And so over time, you will perform poorly and avoid those challenges because, because you don't wanna fail. This need achievement theory is a really core concept in sports psychology. Um, you'll see a lot of athletes sort of get into this avoiding failure situation where they're simply just not comfortable with it. They're not comfortable with losing. They're not comfortable with being evaluated in their performance. For example, I imagine a lot of boxing matches and UFC fights. Um, I think they get to choose their own opponents, right? And so what type of opponent are these fighters choosing? Are they fighting people who they expect to beat? Or are they fighting people who, who is at par with them and who can really compete against them and make them feel successful? It's interesting to see. So if next time there's a UFC fight or a boxing match, try to assess what's going on there in, in terms of need achievement theory. Just some food for thought. So next we have attribution theory. And so first we'll wanna know what attribution means. And the definition for it is how people explain their successes and their failures. And there's really one question that can help you get to the root of attribution theory. And that's, why do you think you performed the way you did today? So say they lost, why do you think you lost today? Or what do you attribute that to? Or on the other hand, why did you win today? What do you attribute your win to? Really, you're gonna wanna pay attention to what the athlete says, right? And we're looking at these three different factors that they may say. And so one is that, is one is the stability factor. So is the reason that they explained, is it permanent or is it something that that is unstable? can shift. Then we have locus of causality. So a factor that is external or internal to the individual. And I'll give an example in just a second. And then we have lotus of control. So is the factor that they attributed their win or loss to, is it under their control or not? So let's dig a little deeper. Here we have a pretty nice figure to visualize this. 
So let's look at each type of factor and get some examples. First, we have stability. We want to talk about factors that are stable or unstable. Uh, let's say that I'm just a really high level athlete and that I am really good at what I do. So in terms of ability, is that stable or unstable? We would argue that ability is stable, right? Usually if you're an elite level, you'll stay an elite level. Your ability is stable. What's unstable might be my attitude going into the competition, right? Maybe today I was just not in a mood. Um, and so that contributed to my loss today. And so attitude is can shift, right? You can have a good day, you can have a bad day. So that would be considered unstable if it if it's able to, to shift like that. And so there's an example. So talent is stable, right? And ability is stable. Um, another thing that's unstable is luck. So sometimes athletes might say, hey, I got lucky. Um, I don't know what happened, but I got lucky today, right? And so luck, obviously, you can have a series of good luck, but you can also have bad luck. And so that is considered to be unstable. So anything, again, anything that's able to shift from yes, no, good, bad is considered unstable. Next, we have locus of causality. So is what you're attributing your loss or win to, is that something that is happening internally or is it happening externally? Effort is internal. So I lost today because uh, I didn't put much effort into it. I feel like I didn't do my best. And that's internal because I, I did it. Um, it's coming from within me. And then external, we have your competition skill level, right? Oh, I lost because they were just better than me. The cause of this is due to something outside of me, is due to something outside of me, external to me. And then lastly, we have locus of control. So is what I am attributing my win loss to, is it in my control or is it out of my control? And so, oh, I lost today because uh, my, the strategy that I came up with was not good, right? The, the plan that I came up with was not good. That is something that I did and is in my control and I can change it moving forward out of my control is again, an opponent's lack of conditioning. So maybe I won today because the opponent just wasn't as good as me, right? They didn't work as hard as me. And so that's out of my control. Um, I'm attributing it to something that I didn't do. I just got lucky again, right? And so that's out of, out of my control. Again, this is a really good figure to sort of help explain or give ex uh, examples of this basic attribution theory. And there are a lot of ways to practice this, right? You can just come up with a reason, pretend you're an athlete, come up with a reason for why you won or why you lost. You know, it snowed while we were playing football today. Why did we lose? So is snowing, is that a stable or unstable attribute? Was it internal or external? And was it in my control or was it out of my control? Right? So those are good ways to sort of just distinguish between the different ones. And so it's really important though to recognize that there are patterns that athletes might begin to show for what is contributing to their wins, what is contributing to their losses, right? And this does affect them psychologically and it will influence the motivation for them to continue playing, right? So so if you are attributing your win to your talent, which is stable, the next time your expectation of success will increase. I won because of my talent and that's not going anywhere. So next time I'm still gonna win. As opposed to unstable, you're not sure what's gonna happen. So your expectation of success, is not gonna be as high. Then we look at the causality factors. If it's something internal to me, um, then I am likely to internalize that, right? So if I win, I'm, prob I'm probably gonna experience pride because it came from within me. 
if I lose, then I'm probably going to experience shame because again, it's because of me that I lost and that's going to affect me emotionally. As opposed to if it's an external cause, then it, it really doesn't matter then, right? It's, if it's something out of my control, then uh, I might feel bad, but maybe I won't. I might feel pride, but maybe I won't because again, it's something that's happening external to me. And then lastly, control factors. So again, if it's in my control, then I'm likely to keep doing it, right? If I did this and I was able to win because of it, I'm going to keep doing it. If it's something out of my control, then my motivation isn't going to increase at all. In fact, it might decrease because there's nothing I can do, right? So why do something if I didn't do it in the first place? And so it's important to think about the language that athletes use after a success and after a failure, right? After you ask them those questions to try to predict what you might see from them later on. And is that affecting them emotionally? Is that affecting them motivationally? Thinking about the different attributions to their success or their failures will help you to, to see that. Okay, we've got two more. So achievement goal theory um, is really interesting. It sort of blends these ideas of competitiveness and achievement motivation, right? So you can have these two types of goals. You can have a goal for achievement and a goal for being competitive, right? And comparing yourself to others. And th that those are perfectly okay. According to this theory, one is motivated by one's interpretation of what it takes to achieve success, right? So again, either you interpret success as achieving a goal, an accomplishment, or you achieve success as being better than another person. However, success for one person may not be success for another person. And like I said, success may be achieved by beating others in competition, or success may be achieved by learning or mastering a task, achievement motivation. We have ego goal orientation, which is what we refer to as competitive goal orientation, right? That's comparing yourself with others and your performance. And then we have task or mastery goal orientation. The goal here is just to improve, it's to be better, to accomplish your own personal goals and not in comparison to other people, right? So you don't have to choose one or the other in this situation, right? You can actually have both. And really it, it can depend on your perceived ability, okay? Um, so do you feel confident in this certain situation? Do you have high perceived ability or low perceived ability? If you have high perceived ability, maybe you're choosing the ego or outcome oriented goals. If you have low perceived ability, maybe all you wanna do is improve even just a little bit, right? So you can choose either or, you can choose both. So the combination of your achievement, motivation, and your perceived competence or ability is gonna predict a few important things, right? It's gonna predict performance, if you succeed or not. It's gonna predict how hard you work. And it's gonna predict if you persist in challenging situations, right? In obstacles. And it's also going to predict, again, which activities you choose, which opponents are you choosing. And so a few key things in terms of achievement goal theory. One is to focus extra attention on task-oriented goals. In sports psychology, we want to promote more task-oriented goals versus ego-oriented goals. Though both are good for you, having us very focused, ego-oriented athlete can be detrimental to them, right? If all they're doing is comparing themselves to others, there can be a lot of really negative consequences to that, as opposed to if you have an athlete who's constantly trying to be better than themselves, then they'll constantly keep improving on their skills and focusing on that mastery level. So when we think about coaches and the sort of motivational climate that they create for their teams, we want it to mostly be task oriented, right? So that they're constantly improving and it's not in comparison to anyone else, because we all know what that can do to an athlete's 
self-confidence, if they are constantly being compared to others and sort of, and not focusing on themselves, right? On their own skills. So again, fostering mastery or task motivational climates is sort of the goal of coaches. So it, it, it can't be good to incorporate some ego oriented stuff, right? Some friendly competition um, within teams that always creates some excitement and, and some additional motivation. But if it's solely, solely focused on ego oriented stuff, then that can be detrimental to athletes. And then lastly, encourage approach goals rather than avoidance failure goals, right? We want them to strive to achieve rather than to avoid to fail. Um, so challenging themselves and encouraging that mindset. Okay, so the last and final theory that we're just going to touch upon is competence motivation theory. This theory is a simplistic sort of version of self-determination theory, which we will talk about in chapter seven. So this theory suggests that perceptions of control or feeling like they can learn and do the skills influences motivation, right? But really it's not the perceptions of control itself, but rather the feelings that they get um, when they feel like they're in control. So feeling that enjoyment, um, that pride in learning a new skill makes them want to feel more motivated essentially. This theory suggests that if we create an environment that helps athletes remain in control, um, if coaches are giving feedback that they're doing well and learning and improving, then athletes feel good about themselves. And so that will make them want to continue to learn, continue to perform and be motivated. And so let's look at some of the research that talks about what we know about high achievers, okay? In terms of motivational orientation, they are high in that achieving success orientation, right? And they're low in terms of avoiding failure. As I mentioned before, they focus on the pride of success rather than the fear of failure, right? And then in terms of attributions, they attribute their successes to things that are stable and internal, right? That's about them. And that's within their control, as opposed to failure, which they attribute to things that are unstable, right? If they fail, it's something that they can change. Um, if they fail, it was something that was out of their control or that happened outside of them, externally to them. The goals that they adopt are usually task goals, right? Rather than ego-oriented goals. And then again, they typically adopt approach goals. They perceive that they have competence and control in what they're doing and that achievement is within their control. The tasks that they use are challenging and competitors are usually at their level and the tasks that they do are, are challenging for themselves as well. And then in terms of performance, they perform well in evaluative conditions. So high achievers, they feel confident they are approaching or looking forward to situations where they can be challenged and evaluated and, and they look forward to it, right? They, they do well in those types of conditions. On the other hand, we have low achievers here. So low achievers worry more about failure than success. They don't really care about achieving things. All they're trying to do is avoid failure. They focus on shame and worry that comes from that failure. So this causes them to be very hesitant and they don't put in as much effort and they try basically try to avoid all these situations. They attribute their successes to things that are unstable, right? Like, oh, I probably did well because I got lucky. To external factors, right? Luck is also an external factor. Like it wasn't anything I did. It was all luck. And then things that are outside their control. And then in terms of failure, they think they fail because of something they did, something stable to them, the complete opposite of what high achievers think. They're focused on failure and outcomes so much because they adopt these, these avoidance goals, right? These avoidance failure goals. They don't think they have a lot of competence and feel like they can achieve, that all their achievement is outside of their control. And then in terms of task choice, they avoid challenges, right? They don't really seek out very difficult things. They, they try to take on 
easier tasks or e easier competitors. And then lastly, in terms of performance, they don't do well um, in evaluative conditions. So when they're put in these situations where they are being evaluated, it causes them to be really stressed out and they don't perform well. So there's a very big difference between high achievers and low achievers, right? In terms of functionality and the types of goals that they set for themselves. So as you develop these, where do they come from, right? And there are different stages of developing these achievement motivation and competitiveness. We have autonomous competence stage, social comparison stage, integrated self and social comparison stage. And this all has to do with sort of the age range, right? That you, that you start to learn these things. And so first we start with the autonomous competence stage. So self-comparison, this is usually when you're a toddler and you start to learn to do things for, on your own by yourself. At this stage, you are learning to be on your own and learning skills on your own, things like that. So you're comparing to yourself. So as you move into the school stage, you move into this social comparison stage. Um, this is when kids get really socially aware and so they start comparing themselves to others and then as you get older you get into this integrating stage where you do both right so you can compare yourself and yourself to others um which is essentially pretty healthy right which is what we what i talked about when we were talking about task and ego oriented goals you sort you want both right you don't want to be just ego oriented. You, you want to have both in order to continue to improve upon yourself. So we have this sort of linear progression of um, a healthy task focus, autonomous competence stage moves on to ego oriented where it gets a little unhealthy right at that age. And then again, to more integrated approach where um, we hope that most people end up in. And so how do we use this? How do we help people become more motivated? The keys to developing this achievement motivation is to first of all, recognize where they are in terms of achievement motivation, right? We wanna make sure that they have those healthy approach oriented goals um, and not that avoidance failure type of achievement motivation, right? That low achievement motivation. The ultimate goal here is to get to that integrated stage. So become more task mastery oriented, as well as some ego orientation in there, some competitiveness. And then lastly, remember that motivational climate influences achievement motivation, right? So like I said, coaches have a really important role in being able to create those motivational climates um, to make them more task oriented versus ego oriented and to know where that balance is in order to keep their athletes motivated and energized um, to train, practice, and compete. Okay, so a few more things that we can do um, in our own practices, whether we're coaches, sports psych consultants, um, athletes, them, athletes ourselves, right? We can, we can focus on these things. So recognizing the interaction of personal and situational factors in influencing achievement behavior. Um, that's that first thing that we talked about, right? Knowing where these sources of motivation come from. It comes from ourselves and it comes from the situation that we're in. So recognizing those interactions, not making a huge deal out of those ego-oriented goals, but really, really just emphasizing those task goals. Um, creating a task-oriented motivational climate, which we talked about, and then monitor and alter your attributional feedback. So um, pay attention to what you're attributing your wins and losses to. What's that saying about you? What's that saying about what you think about yourself? And just keep in mind that that influences your motivation. Assess and correct inappropriate participant attribution. So again, um, kind of repeating what I just said, helping participants determine when to compete and when to focus on individual improvement being able to know when it's appropriate to compete and when it's appropriate to just get better. And lastly, enhancing perceptions of competence and control. And just knowing that those types of feedbacks can um, 
how that affects someone's perception of how they're doing and their confidence and their competence creates an emotional reaction, which um, could then feed on improving their motivation. Okay, that's it for motivation. I know it was kind of long this week, but hopefully you got some good info about it and got some clarity on a lot of the theories. So make sure you know the theories and then I will see you next week. Have a great week, everyone.